Mars, huge crimson orbit covering one fifth of the red planet's surface, making a warm, wet, and ideal for alien life to gain a foothold, scientists say. Massive ancient ocean once covered nearly half of the northern hemisphere of Mars, making the planet a more promising place for alien life to have had, to have gained a foothold. Huge body of water spread over the fifth planet's surface. A great portion of the Atlantic Ocean covers Atlantic covers the Earth about a mile deep in places, and it held about 13 million cubic miles of water. That's pretty brief, wasn't it? Mm. The first uh, first star uh, fast star first fled from a supernova now in the galaxy, and a thermal nuclear explosion went off next door to Runaway Two, the fastest known flip free flying star in the galaxy, is hightailing it out up here at about 750 miles a second after surviving its sibling star death as a massive supernova. Clocking the star speed could pin down the nature of the stellar explosion which had lied on the cosmic ruler by which we measure the universe. Known as US 708, the star was first discovered about 10 years ago and appears to be a remnant of a red giant that has been stripped of all its hydrogen, leaving behind a dense hot core of helium that is around a third of the mass of the sun. March 20th, uh, we had an eclipse. Obviously, uh, Lucerus 120, uh, the, uh, and uh, we've given a report on that as well. So you can do the math that it's uh, find out that the biggest draw event of the Ceres period is not equal to a whole number of days. The extra eight hours means that the Earth rotates an additional one third of a day. So subsequent eclipses are visible in different parts of the globe. Feature another book. There's another. That's a picture picture of the eclipses uh, in order, that's a Saros, uh, and it's 136, that, the big one that's actually going to go, uh, we're going to actually, uh, we had one that went through Mexico, uh, as you can see in 1991, also in Hawaii, and uh, that's, those are the charts that we usually go for on that. And this is the eclipse that we just saw, as you can see, uh, 20, uh, March 20, 2015, you can see it up there by Iceland, and that's where I was for that eclipse. And this is another photo of Cerros 120. Uh, did Jupiter smash solar system's first looks like planets? Did Jupiter, uh, Jupiter may have acted like a giant wrecking ball in the newborn solar system, roaming in to destroy an early generation of inner planets before retreating to its current uh, orbit? Typical planetary system is made up of a few super Earths, rocky planets up to 10 times the mass of the Earth, orbiting much closer to their stars than Mercury does the Sun. Or a planetary system that possess giant planets similar to Saturn and Jupiter typically have them much closer to their stars than in the solar system. Our solar system is looking increasingly like an oddball, study co author Gregory Longman, University of California, Santa Cruz, famous state. Uh, this is uh, global warming isn't happening on Mars, so face up to it on Earth. That's the conclusion of analysis of the red planet's melting polar ice cap, which shows that Swiss cheese like pits forming in the ice are part of the natural cycle, not unusual warming. The pits were first spotted at the carbon dioxide ice cap at the, mouth, the Martian's south, south Pole in 1999, then pictured again in 2001, a one year later. Compared the image to reveal the pits had grown by a few yards. At that rate, the entire ice cap would disappear in a few thousand years. Some climate skeptics suggest this meant our neighboring planet is undergoing a global warming, just like here. Uh, so the sun, not humans, must have been behind the warming of both planets. Curiosity has actually found fatty acids on Mars. Um, Curiosity rover has detected that may, may be fatty acid molecules on the soil of the red planet, though it's not clear whether it is biological in origin. Find was presented by David Clayman, uh, who works on the rover SAM interest, uh, instrument at the Lunar Planetary Science Conference in Woodlands, Texas. Uh, uh, SAM analysis gas is released. Uh, by heating samples of rock, and the results are interpreted by matching the data to compounds analyzed on Earth. One SAM reading uh, seems to relate a type of fatty acid molecule 
This, these are important for life because organisms use them to build all cell membranes, but they could have a non-biological origin. Uh, we've seen more about uh, Ceres. It's a dwarf planet, giant potential. NASA's Dawn spacecraft gears up for the first in-depth look at this tiny world. Uh, speculation is right. Could Ceres be an overgrown comet? Was an ocean made of mud? Or even possess icy volcanoes? There's more to be learned from the, um, the system, uh, from Dawn's presence. And uh, once Ceres gets clear of the sun, uh, we'll get a better look at that. Those ice spots could be, uh, those, those spots could be ice on there as reflected. We'll know more about that later. Again, we're talking about that maybe heavily watered, which would uh, put it in the classification of Europa and Enceladus. The first year-long stay at the ISS is about to begin. Uh, the uh, Scott Kelly is going to join Mikhail Kornienko and Gennady Pilkadalka uh, on the Soyuz spacecraft to launch on the 20th of March, which they already did. They're already up there. Uh, they're going to be reading uh, the, the uh, biological uh, readouts from Kelly because his twin, uh, identical twin brother Mark, who is also an astronaut, will spend a year on the ground and do some comparative studies on that. Uh, the rock raft from the asteroid that aimed human missions to Mars. Uh, on Wednesday, NASA revealed plans to grab a boulder off a nearby asteroid, throw it into orbit around the moon, and then send humans out for a visit. The mission will help us learn about asteroids and prepare for future crew trips into space. Rocket spacecraft will take off in December of 2020, potentially headed for the asteroid Itakawa. Uh, they'll take a boulder about 13 feet across, transport it to the moon, and then in 2025 we'll go and look at it. Ship. Uh, the scorch marks left uh, by uh, Mars that, that, that will soon fade. This is really not a really big story, but just the same as it looks like Mars does kind of tidy itself up with winds and such. Uh, twin Earths may be working in their nearest star system. There is some uh, said to the wobble of Alpha Centauri that, in fact, it may in fact have a couple of rocky planets uh, near to it, which we have not been able to pick up by any other means except for the wobble. Uh, there's been a strange radio system uh, burst from space. Uh, they seem to follow a mathematical pattern. The pattern is real. Either some strange celestial physics is going on in the universe or artificial produced by alien technology. They are very far away. Nothing to worry about. They're not coming here. They and uh, the moon has two tails. Uh, it's wearing a tail coat. Turns out our satellite has two tails of particles streaming in its wake. But the same is true of the other mind in the solar system. It could give us a way to study their surfaces without having to land. Uh, the dark energy could signal the collapse of the universe. We've been talking about this for quite a while, and there's more studies going on about it now. It may be because of the ever-quickening expansion, and it may uh, trigger the universe's death and a cataclysmic collapse. Uh, again, nothing you need to worry about. Total Eclipse was on April the 4th with Gary uh, um, talked about. Uh, I saw the beginning of it, then I went inside and went to the website of McDonald Observatory and got to see the rest of it. No, you didn't. I sure did. You saw it on a computer screen. Okay. <laughs> it was a live broadcast, and as far as the lunar eclipse is concerned, that's fine. Right? This was a very short eclipse, obviously. It only occurred for about five minutes because it was right at the rim. And I have one photograph of that from the McDonald's. And Patsy Comics may have painted Mercury back black, and that is, uh, that is uh, comic dust. Um, uh, they go around and they have spread on there. Uh, Mercury is a very, very black object, and that was probably how it was. And that is the end of the news for uh, 4-6-2015. Um, we've added another feature to In the News, and Chuck's going to come up right now and discuss In the Sky, and hopefully this will be an ongoing uh, program.
program. So, Chuck, you're, you're getting, all you need to do is touch the thing there, and as you go along, just touch that number one there, and you're good to go. Thank you, Ken. So, as, as Ken mentioned, in the sky, there's a number of different types of that we're going to be having at Cranbrook meetings, at least for the next few meetings and hopefully far into the future. Uh, the whole idea is that uh, we'll spend about five minutes uh, at the Cranbrook meetings uh, talking about five upcoming events or things that can be viewed. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be events, they can be objects, they can be occurrences. Uh, but uh, the idea is things that are in the night sky they can look at and see between now and the next Cranbrook. So this will be in the sky for April 2015. So, um, as Ken mentioned, there was a recent total solar eclipse. Unfortunately, it's too late to view that, so I won't be talking about it. And there was a total lunar eclipse that Ken also talked about that uh, is also in the past, and obviously you can't see it now because it's too late. There we'll talk about that either. About that. This is the fourth of the tetra. Uh, yeah. There's going to be another uh, of the two-year period, four of them, the last, that fourth one is going to come So this is number three of the Tetra? Yeah, three of the four. Okay. four. But that's going to be coming up not so long yet, September? September 27th, the day after Kensington Astronomy at the beach. But uh, since I won't be talking about those past eclipse events, I want to talk about things that you can see that are upcoming, that will be in the month of April. Um, turns out that April is a pretty good month for viewing the International Space Station. There's going to be a number of passes. Actually, I think tonight there are two passes, one at 8.30, one at 10.30. But for about the next week or so, um, there are going to be about two passes of the night. So I think between April 4th and April 12th, there's at least one pass per night, two passes most nights. But the one particular I want to point out is April 8th. Uh, there you can see the path across the sky, and it turns out the National Space Station passes within, definitely within a couple of degrees, maybe even closer, uh, passes uh, quite close to Venus. Um, so that ought to be an interesting uh, observation, provided that there are uh, clear skies. So um, it's a little bit hard to read on there exactly, but uh, the ISS rises around 8.38, uh, disappears around 8.48, and passes close to Venus around 8.42 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. You can actually read it on the screen. Oh, can you? Oh, yeah. yeah it's much clearer on the screen. It's tiny up here, though. Um, so uh, another thing that you might want to look out for is um, uh, around the middle um, of the month, uh, if you look towards the western sky, you should see a nice uh, trio, the Pleiades star cluster, the Hyades star cluster, and Venus will be in close proximity. It says April 11th here. Uh, this will be facing west shortly after dark. Uh, it won't exclusively be April 11th. You can uh, probably view this uh, for a good chunk of April facing west because <coughs> Venus is moving that quickly through the sky at this point relative to those two star clusters. Um, another thing to look out for is that there's actually a uh, meteor shower in April. The April Lyrid meteor showers uh, are peaking on April 22nd. Um, it's a fairly narrow peak, so you know, plus or minus a day, you should be able to see an elevated number of meteors relative to just the uh, background uh, number. Um, the peak is only about 20 per hour, so it's not a particularly active meteor shower. But the good news is that there's um, uh, pretty much no lunar interference. The moon will be small crescent on that particular night will set quite early, whereas uh, Lyra rises rather late, so um, observing around uh, midnight and looking towards the northeast should be a uh, good viewing if you want to check out some meteors. And then uh, another thing to keep your eye out for is Jupiter is very well placed for observing. Um, back in January, there was a triple shadow transit across Jupiter, which was a pretty special event, a pretty rare event. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other opportunities to observe shadows of Jupiter's moons passing across the, uh, the surface of the planet. Um, in fact, there are quite many. These are ones that I've selected that are um, occurring between, or at least having a partial occurring between uh, sunset and midnight. Um, there are others that observe at more, more unusual hours, but uh, the, all of these are readily viewable in the evening, so you can see uh, a lot of times here. Um, if you're interested in this, send me an email, um, and I can give you uh, the list if you want, but, uh, um, or visit me during the break, and uh, I can show you the list as well. Like a lot of opportunities for viewing shadow transits on Jupiter if you haven't seen one. And uh, finally, just uh, you know, springtime, of course, is uh, 
the time of year when people love to go out and observe galaxies. It's really the, uh, the time of year when the sky is uh, uh, having more galaxies than you probably have time to observe them. But um, for those of you who are um, relatively new to galaxy observing, um, probably one of the uh, most favorite uh, of, of all galaxies um, are actually a pair of galaxies, M81 and M82, which can be readily found uh, by looking for the Big Dipper, following the arrows as shown there on the, uh, on the left, and, uh, and locating it rather easily. So even in small telescopes, uh, the M81 and M82 galaxy pairing is, is a favorite of mine and favorite of a lot of people, and uh, definitely a good target for those of you just starting out. And uh, that's in the sky for April 2015. Question. Yes. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, one thing you missed was the Nova and the Kiko. It was dimming, now it's getting brighter again. You can see it. Really? Oh, yeah. Nova Sagittarii. In yeah. Sagittarius? It's in, yeah. uh, no, it's the Nova in, uh, on the Kiko. In the Sagittarius. In so, so, the lid, so the lid in the middle of the teapot, the Nova is right between the bottom stars. So now instead of a triangle, the lid forms a diamond. So if you have dark skies, when if you not? had clear skies some morning, I've been trying for a week and a half to see it. What was the peak? Coming. Uh, like six, four and a half. Six, nine, nine. What did you? Was somebody said yeah, four and a half. half. It, it's, it's up to four. Uh, no, it, no. it brightened. It, it, it brightened. It's in now. So is it a nova or a supernova? No, it's a nova. It's a nova. So it's with. Yeah, it's with. Like a six again. So you can not find it. You said went down to nine. So it peaked at nine to six. Back at six to six five or so. It, it was almost it was it was almost up to fourth. It yeah, was above four point five. That's that's a good announcement. I wasn't even aware of it. Thanks. I also want to mention this year for the rest of the summer, Jupiter's moons are lined up with each other. So you can actually watch one moon pass in front of the other moon. Just this year. It only happens uh, for about a year every six years. So this is the summer to look for Jupiter's moons passing in front of each other. Excellent. Well with the